So we'll make a start. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a warm welcome to our session, Gastronomic Travels Through the Archipelago, A Singapore Story. If you love to travel and you love good food, you're in the right place. For our speaker for today is a historian. He's also a cultural and social anthropologist, as well as a collector of cultural artifacts. And today, he is also the author of this wonderful publication you see here called The Food of Singapore Malays. It won the prestigious Book of the Year Award at this year's Singapore Book Awards 2022. In many ways, this book brings us on a journey, travels through the gorgeous Southeast Asian archipelago. It will cover people and food, and most importantly, it is also known for its older Indonesian Javanese name, the Nusantara. It was sitting as a vital trade route that connected China in the Northeast, India, the Middle East, as well as Europe in the West. And it's there that we will find the culture of people. As Chef Anton Mossiman explains in his foreword in the book, when you taste Malay food, you are tasting a region and you are tasting the world. So without further ado, let's put our hands together to welcome Kia Johari. Kia. Thank you very much, Mindy, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Sunday the last day of the uh, book fair, Sunday afternoon, to be with us. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I chose the Thanksgiving Day last year uh, as the date of release for this book. It's my way of giving thanks after you know, a journey of 11 years trying to put everything together. The research, the photography, uh, all the empirical evidence into, into words. So, I was excited that a week after the book's release, the first review came out, not from Singapore, not from any Asian platform or media. The first review came out of Germany from the University of Greifswald. A history professor by the name of Dr. Alexander Drauss said, this is the book that we need to talk about in the Baltic, because just look at the parallel. It's time for us to talk about trans-regional celebration of food. You know, whether you are you know, in Germany or Poland or Lithuania, we have the same climate, the same environment, look at the ecology. You know, we understand you know, vegetable the way it is and how to preserve it for winter. So just based on this book, because this book looks at the region the maritime region known as Nusantara or the Malay Archipelago. So, I want to start by sh sharing with you this map, an Ottoman map of 1732. This is from the, the uh, Istanbul archive. What's really interesting about this map is that this was done 92 years before the carving out of the region by the Dutch and the uh, British powers into two separate you know, sphere of influence. So before that, it was one region with very much sort of you know, unifying uh, language and culture. So there's, there, is something, there is something universal about good ideas. You look at the region, good ideas. Um, you know, good ideas travel well, right? Um, so there's, there's something also in it about human beings and you know, learning from each other. So you know, a nifty way of harvesting or tasty way of preparing food. So such was the case in the maritime, in the maritime region known as Nusantara as well. Okay. Now the food of Singapore Malays, this book, wants to use Singapore as a vantage point to look across the region. 
So it, in order to, to understand um, the region, I think you also need to look at Singapore's role. role. It was a free port under the British. It became an embarkation point for the Hajj for the region, whether you're from Java or from the Philippines or you're from Guangdong, that was the embarkation point for the Hajj, to make your way through the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea. Singapore became the publishing and the printing centre of the region, and later the hub for performing arts. So that, all of these, drew so many people from the region for this so-called New York of the Nusantara. So many of us are familiar you know, with the glass, concrete, steel, downtown, downtown you know, skyline of Singapore, but to understand food history, one needs to step back. Let's look at this. Coastal homes, right? Coastal living, we are islanders, right? So whether it's coastal living like this, amphibious homes, or in the urban cosmopolitan setting of Kampung Glam, regardless, there is an understanding of your geography. So the grandmother, she just foraged some palm leaves so can, she could use for food packaging. So foraging was, was a traditional practice. Um, now almost lost, but now has also become a hot topic, especially among young people. Ah, let's take a look at this. When we talk about the region, if you look at travelogues by Western travelers in the region, it is as if it's incomplete if you mention no encounter of this king of fruits, right? Durian, from the Malay word duri means thorn, durian, that which has thorns. What about this? What was the source of sugar? They have the sugar palm, right? That produces, today we know it has the lowest glycemic index. Right. Now, along the shores, Singapore being an island, the region along the shores, you encounter sea grapes, now very fashionable in, in the fancy restaurants, or the celebration of the delights of the row of your horseshoe crab. Now, of course, you know, sea urchin, right? So you don't have to go to Hokkaido. Well, you know, the islands of Singapore, you find this, and you know how you could sort of, uh, you know, sort of blend it with your pasta to make your uni sauce. You know? The art of foraging, whether you're foraging on land, you know, or you're foraging in intertidal spaces. No, apart from foraging, there was something else, something, something older, right? Also, this is a stone stele from Sumatra, 7th century. It's a royal, almost a royal decree, right? It's a, the inscription talks about a royal orchard. So let's take a look, let's take a look at the, trans, the, the transcription, what it says here. Four main crops we have, areca palm, coconut palm, sugar palm, and sago palm. And let's take a look at the botanic print equivalent of it all. Yeah. So very much described, you know, what were the staples of the, of the region? Coconut is still the kernel of gastro Malay gastronomic culture. Yeah. Look at this. this uh, have you seen this before? This is, this is when the coconut is about to germinate to become a new tree. You see this spongy little uh, sort of a byproduct of the, the endosperm. How about this? Also from the coconut. But what you're looking for this, in this case is you're looking at the CPU, the heart of palm. So when you, you, you fell a tree like this, just to get a heart of palm, there goes the tree. But again, in the Malay world, there's an understanding that every part of the coconut is put to good use. Now, this book is about, I would say, about reconstructing. It's about recreating, rediscovering. So looking at old journals, for example, the Royal Asiatic uh, Society Journal of, uh, uh, out of uh, 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 England, there's been records of you know, how do people fish in the past. So this is not your Neptune or your Aquaman, but this is the uh, 
how fishing was done in the past, by spear fishing. Or the understanding that's lost, the understanding of how do you go about fermenting, preserving something before the advent of refrigeration. In this case, it's a giant clam. What do you do with the giant clam? Ah, fermentation can last you for more than a year. Can you imagine you do your island hopping from island to island? What do you consume? And what about this? A very ancient way of pulping, of grinding your food before your food processor. Hmm? Or the understanding of leaves as food packaging, whether it's coconut frond in this case, or the palm frond to make your cakes. Now, the other thing about reconstructing is understanding um, influences from abroad. This is, they're making a, noodle, a, noodle, a kind of noodle called lapsha or laksa that has its roots in Persia. So in the Malay world, the long stringy thing could come from three different cultures. It could come from China, it could come from Thailand or Siam, or it could come from Persia or the Persianate world. What about this? No, Chile only made its way to the Malay world post Colombian exchange. When things from the New World, from South America, made its way to Asia. But over time, this grandmother, I, I, you don't have to see a picture of her, she was able to transform something that's hot to, into candy. So this is, this is chili glacé. So how do you cook in big volumes, right? You, know, you improvise, you get stone and become your, sto your stove. Oh, understanding Malay really all technology. So you were to bake some cakes, right? You could bake your cake using your aluminum pan, using your silicon mold. But what if you use your brass mold? What happens? You realize that, wow, the brass has to, you know, one of the best, you know, uh, uh, heat conduction. Now, a book like this should also talk, should also celebrate about the wonders of food, not just for sustenance, just not just for enjoyment, but as a food as medicine. So there is a saying in the Malay world, why eat medicine? Why not eat, why not eat food that becomes medicine? So here we have, this is the turmeric tonic. Right? Of course, these days you know, you, in New York, you walk into Whole Foods and buy a shot for $5, a shot of turmeric, but it has really, it's, it's an ancient practice. So to look at food as medicine, we are also lucky because we have this all this repository of cookbooks, you know, way back from 1845, printed cookbooks. So they are not only repository of recipes, but also teaches you things like aesthetics of food. You know, what kitchenware do you use? Right? You know, all the various tips in the kitchen. Do take note. This, some of these are written in. Arabic script. It's Malay in Arabic script. Earlier you saw that stone, that stele, that was Malay in a very Indic script. So it made its way to Arabic, and then finally we have the Romanized or Latinized script today. Aesthetic of food. Food must also be beautiful. And this is beautiful. I love the color. I love the combination. But there's a lot more. There's, there's a lot of significance to nasi ambeng. What is this exactly? It is cosmology on a food. I mean, it sounds very interesting, but it's cosmology on a food. Basically, you have everything on the, tra on the tray. An ingredient from the sky, ingredient from the sea, on land, and under the ground. All represented in one plate. It is a celebration, it's a thanksgiving food. Started as a sacred food in the region, um, and then it became what it is today. Yeah. A, mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier about you know, serveware, dinnerware. This is interesting. This is a Malay silver cake dish commissioned by the last Sultan of Riau, now part of Indonesia, for the coronation of Queen Wilhelmina of Netherlands. So it was sent to Holland for her coronation. 
So we benefited from the Colum all the various exchanges. Yeah? Um, if you look at the Malay world, the island expands, stretches the distance of London to Baku. It's not even London to Moscow. Beyond Moscow, it's all the way to Azerbaijan. That's how wide the Malay archipelago is. So that's one in terms of distance. But you look at the Mediterranean, Mediterranean benefited from the sub-Saharan African countries, right? the Levantine region, and also we have Europe, West, Southern Europe. But in the Malay world, there's a lot more to that, apart from that, that width, right, the breadth. It is established by two major civilizations, India and China. So Nusantara went through a period of Indianization. So we have two in major influences. And then what's next? The arrival of Islam, exchange Islamicus. So the Arabs came, the Persian world came and introduced not just trade, I mean, they, they, bring, they brought with them their trade, but also a new way of life, a new faith, and new things about food, and food words, food names. Yeah. What's next? Colombian exchange. The, the Europeans were in search of an alternative route to Nusantara. Nusantara is, has always been the cradle of spices. Nutmeg, cloves, you name it. So they were looking for an alternative route, started with the Portuguese, then the Spanish, then the Dutch, then the British. Of course, you know, we also had you know, the, the Danes as well. And they brought Chile. Now, this is, this is distinctively Southern Indian. The string hoppers, putumayang. But look at the pairing. It's paired with caramelized durian sauce. Yeah. Familiar form, familiar function, but maybe different feelings, but different names. Yeah. Thanks to the Portuguese for introducing to the Malay world the idea of beating your eggs. You wish your eggs, yes? And then we have the uh, bolu, which is the Portuguese word for cakes. No, you see, but the, here's a picture, a postcard picture of tapioca. Tapioca or cassava came from South America. But when it comes to cultural exchanges, it's never one way. Let's take a look at this reverse cultural transmission. This is Sago. Um, Sago made its way to Europe and had an illustrious career, let's put it that way. When Sago was finally introduced, it, it managed to not only retain its name in European languages as Sago or, or Sago or, Sa or Sagu, and there was a period in Germany that thanks to uh, German 17th century travelers, they saw this bread made of Sago, and you know, it, Sago could travel. Right? The flock would travel to, Ge to Germany. So by the 19th and 20th century, according to the linguist uh, professor Varuno Mehdi, I think he's based in Berlin, he said, you will, never, you will not find a book, a German recipe book on 19th and 20th century without having a recipe on using sago in the pudding or dessert. I like this picture because it depicts really what Malay food is all about. Malay food, what we call Malay food today, is a story of hybridity. It's a story of localization. Here we have roti kirai, this, this yellow color. It looks like a piece of lace. It's a lace, lacy pancake. Roti comes from the Sanskrit word. It means like flatbread. But this particular roti is a Malay concoction and it's paired with Indian-inspired curry and plated on this English plate. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty much sort of you know, it's em emblematic of, of what Malay food is all about today. And given you know, how wide the Malay world is, you know, I had, uh, we had difficulty, myself and my team, how do we go about telling the world, telling people, friends in Germany or telling friends in, in the US about M Malay sweets? 
So we had to do what you call a taxonomy, a classification of all of this with the help of an illustrator because there are too, just too many. Again, a reminder to Malay Archipelago, the Cradle of Spices. So we, we you know, today, we are still, we are still reminded that we still, we are in a maritime, pretty much a maritime world. These are fruits of the intertidal spaces. What about this? This looks very exotic, isn't it? Fruits from the jungle. But you know, it's, it made its way to, this is, this is one of our favorites. Legume, some people call it stinking beans. If you have traveled to Southeast Asia, you might encounter this. Yeah? All of this you can find when you travel to Singapore to this market. This is an experience to be had. You know, when we travel, sometimes you go first thing, our first place that we want to go is the museum or the market because that's where you see, you know, the real people. You see where, you know, how people conduct their, their life and what the locals eat. So this is the Gilang Store Market. It's a, a great place to, to visit. So I want to thank you for being here, but I, it's not over yet. I just have a little video to share the making of the book. Just, just a six minute video. You could, you could, you could, you could uh, you, so bear with me. So yes, thank you very much for being here. And uh, could we play the video, please? It's the making of the book. Ambling. Ambling. Ambling means to come together. We Singaporeans love yeah. food, but there is so much more to food than what we eat. It is who we are. My lifelong love of food cannot be separated from my identity as a Singaporean Malay. But what is Malay food? What's so Malay about Malay food? Put it another way, how does Malay food reflect the cultures histories and beliefs of the Malay people. These are the questions that I wanted to address in my book. Bukan satu pujaan yang sedang. Tengok 10 tahun dalam pembinaan nak bikin ni. Bukan tak sedang. Kalau begitu, janganlah lupa gambaran ni. Bacalah, usahalah macam mana pun kita majukan diri kita. Mana nak cari ilmu ni? Kalau macam dalam malaman barang ni, kita dah terlepas, dah habis lah. Ilmu, keluarkan ilmu-ilmu yang kita tak tahu. I think the book captures so much about the role of food in your everyday life, right? The role of food in your, your celebration, the role of food in your literature, for instance. We talk about how Malay food is under research, is under recognized. This book is all about retelling, right? This book is about reconstructing and rediscovering. That's what this book is all about. What goes into this book? That's where we talk about, yes, there are 16 chapters, right? 16 chapters that covers topics like people, space, yeah? Your geography, right? The flora and fauna. We talk about foraging. Way before we have our markets, we talk about agriculture, fishing, husbandry. And then, now that we have all this material, we prepare. When we have excess, we preserve. What do we do with all this food? Ah, food, you know, as edible medicine. And we look into the things that we enjoy, like, for instance, our sweets and dainties. What's next? Food. How, where do we serve food? Food in celebration. And how do we prepare them? It has to be beautiful. So we, took, we look into the aesthetics of food. And we look into the role or the presence of food in our songs, our literature. And then we take a look at the, even a larger picture. Let's take a look at the idea of interconnectedness of culture you know, and food. The roles played by different you know, civilization so that we can enjoy the food, that, the Malay food that we call Malay food today. And finally, we need to have a sort of a, a discussion about the future of Malay food. So let's take a look at food and the politics of identity also. 
So if you are a member of academia, there'll be something for you. If you are just you're a foodie, you want to know how food was prepared in the past. If you just want to be able to recreate some old recipes, absolutely, we have 32 recipes for you. They're all hand-picked. You know, it's a nice cross-section of you know, different things, you know, from rice to vegetables to noodles, you know, sweet, savoury, it's all in there. Officially, we started in November 2010. That's when uh, we did our first photo shoot. Why photo shoot first? Because we were racing for, for time. Uh, with, you know, with the elders, you know, they, they were getting on. Uh, we were, you know, at the same time collating, you know, information, recipes, stories, and all the various interviews and, and meetups. So we thought, you know, it's good that we start first by capturing the images. And then we went into, you know, the writing part of it. A huge amount of time was spent on just the research part alone. But of course, before you could even start on the research, you need to have your raw material. So, you know, that entails, among other things, going to the British Library or making a trip to the Leiden University Library to get material. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. So you need to have all your pieces. So the more pieces you have, you get a better picture, right? And sometimes you just have to join dots. And then also at the same time, given all this material, you know, all this inner you know, sources, uh, and with the right argument, you'll be able to extrapolate and also even synthesize new ideas about you know, how food came about, about this journey you know, of food you know, in the Malay world. Along the shores of Siglap at one time, when it's at the right season, you're able to scoop out of the water you know, all these little, small little prawns that you use for making your blachan. But today, we don't even have that tool called a sondong. So we went to what is today you know, in the Indonesian water to be able, in the Riau Islands, to be able to capture someone using the sondong. So Sufai actually jumped into the waters so that she's able to capture the best angle. People want to know, why did it take 11 years? Because you have, first of all, you have to amass all this material. It's so hard to find a dedicated book just on Malay food. Right? It's scattered in, in Hikayat, it's scattered in travelogue. So you, you, know, you have to extract you know, here and there to be able to understand you know, Malay food. So there are dedicated you know, cookbooks, but to understand food, you know, food culture, food ways, uh, that is something that you have to look you know, at various you know, sources. Oh, I think this book is authored by so many people. So many people, every, every grandmother, you know, every uncle that contributed a recipe, they are the authors of this book. The people who had you know, the, the crockery on loan, right? the people who, who provide me tips, provide me stories about mythology, about the waters around mainland island Singapore. These are the people who contributed. It has been a wonderful journey. Thank you everyone for contributing to this heritage project. So here it is. The food of Singapore Malays, gastronomic travels through the archipelago. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've been more than happy to take in the questions. If you, you have any, any questions at all? I, I want to finish the question from the gentleman about nasi ambeng. Ambeng is a Javanese word means coming together. So nasi ambeng is the nasi or the rice that is served when people come together. Yeah. So it's, it is celebratory. Yes. So are there any more questions that we can take? Yes, please. In just a couple of minutes, yeah. but we'll strive to take as many questions as we can. Kiel, I have a burning question for you. What is your favourite M Singapore Malay food dish? Oh, wow, that's very hard, you know. It's like having 10 kids and asking me which is my favourite kid. I love all of them. Uh, but if you ask me what's my favourite comfort food, I can tell you it is nasi lemak. Yeah? Nasi is rice, lemak is the coconut from the coconut cream. So it's coconut rice. Why do I like it? Because it is a complete dish. You get the carbohydrates from the rice, the lipids from the coconut cream, you get the protein from the omelette and the fish, uh, you get your roughage from your, from your little vegetable on the side. Um, it's also a story about like yin and yang. 
despite the, this, the, the sauce that goes with it, the, chip, the sambal is hot, but the cucumber cools it down. So it's really, there's so much harmony and balance in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please. Did you, uh, yes, go ahead. Yes. I'm just curious, uh, did you research also uh, did you research also the, well, I have two questions actually. One is, did you research also the health properties of like the rationale behind creating the food the way they look and the way they are? You know, I guess probably in terms of like kueh lapis, for instance, I suppose you wouldn't be able to uh, attribute much health properties to it, you know, because it's pure sugar. But but I, but I yet, in, uh, and the second question is, I'm also curious whether in your book you also address probably uh, some of the, Longer histor gastronomic history of the of the food itself, right before it came to be in Singapore, like the transformation and how it looked the way that by the time it arrived in Singapore. Thank you. Uh, let me answer the qu second question first. Yes, the book attempts to uh, to address the question, the evolution, how it came about, and looking at you know, sort of the food beyond geopolitical boundaries. So definitely look at, but not every food because it's just I mean as it is, six hundred twenty-four pages already so so what can look at key 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 of food yeah, i do the first question uh looking at uh, uh cake lapis well this cake lapis there's more than sugar in it there's lots of you know egg they like like any other cake right what do we have we have the butter we have the flour we have the eggs all in it but there's also a mantra in the malay world whatever when you makan whatever you eat is always in moderation so it reminds me of Julia Child, you know, when, when she celebrated her 90, 93rd birthday, they asked Julia Child, saying, why is your food, there's so much butter in it? And she said, eat less, eat less often. I will not compromise. Why should I use, would not use something else to substitute butter? Likewise, the Malay world, you know, if you have some food that you think is of concern, but, you know, eat less, less often. But again, the mantra has always been in the Malay world is eat in moderation. Yes, please. Just now you mentioned about the turmeric, uh, the, the turmeric drink. Yes. That was quite fascinating because I, I take turmeric now in terms of powder form for the health properties. So, and just now you mentioned about how the prawns were harvested, the little prawns, and that's krill, which has essential fatty acids. So what do you think is the next undiscovered Malay food that, that has health properties that others should know? Oh, there's a whole long <laughs> list. Maybe share about some. Thanks. There's, there's a whole long list. Just look at... I managed to, to put together uh, a glossary of all the various herbs, and some of these are not even translatable wow. in, 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 you know, in the English. Yeah? There are scientific names for, for each one of them, but that's yet to be discovered. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Are there any final burning questions? I think we've covered quite a fair bit, and that's so exciting today because we finally are in Germany and we're able to actually explain the book and talk about the people and the culture. So, what's a food book without some food? So, Kier has brought in today, especially his own delicacy, Grey Lapis. Kier, can you tell them a little bit about what they're going to have? Right, so... Uh yeah, as, you, as you step out later, thank you for being here. It's a little uh, sort of incentive. Uh, please enjoy the kick lapis. I brought it all the way from Singapore. Uh, you know, I made my own spice. Again, you know, being in the, in the cradle of spices, you know how to go about dealing with your, your nutmeg, your maize, your cardamom. Uh, it has been, the cake has been spiced. Is layered? Why is it, why is the cake, why is clear cake layered? Is it aesthetic? I, the answer is, Necessary is the mother of in inventions. Yeah. There was a need to, how do you go about, because the idea of whisking eggs is fairly new in the Malay world, and we don't have the oven that we have today. So, so what we had was a micro oven, quote unquote micro oven, where you apply your charcoal, your wood, fire from the top and bottom. So you get them. So this is produced originally using that micro oven. Well, of course, today I, I use my... <laughs> my conventional oven. Please enjoy as you step out. You know, I mean, uh, of the, before you step out of the hall, yes. Enjoy the enjoy the quay. I'll be I'll be I'll gonna be around. So if you have any question at all, you know, please feel free to ask. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. And most importantly, we'll say we'd like to say a special thank you as well to the Frankfurt Book Fair, to Claudia, and especially to the technical team who has been so kind to us. Thank you so much for your help. Yeah, thank you very much, We're Claudia. Really, really thank you, Frankfurt here. Book Fair. Thank you so You're much. So